All right, welcome to Walk the Talk Show with Waylon Lewis, hosted by ElephantJournal.com and in partnership with Google+. Thanks to them. I'm honored today. We've had a lot of amazing guests over the years, um, but today might, I was just saying, might be our biggest <coughs> reaction in social media in our um, eight-year history of doing videos. Marianne Williamson, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. So Marianne, just to introduce you so you don't have to, uh, you know, toot your own horn, um, is a six-time New York Times bestselling author and part of the reason for the incredible excitement is that uh, she has put her hat in the ring uh, to run for Congress, which is not something, there's a great quote out there that is something like, good people are often led, led by bad people because good people are unwilling to jump into the mud. Um, so I, uh, as someone passionate about politics and service, am personally very inspired. I was introduced uh, virtually to Marianne through our mutual friend Sean Korn. Um, who also uh, engages in service. She's a wonderful yoga teacher uh, and founded Off the Mat. So we typically begin these conversations with a moment of prayer or <coughs> silence or um, meditation. And Marianne is um, a little bit more skilled than me, as you'll see, in leading such. So I've asked Marianne, uh, would you mind leading us in a moment of uh, silence or prayer? We take this moment having taken a deep breath. We close our outer eye and open to the light within. The place of wisdom, the place of peace. A truer truth than the truth of this world. And we center ourselves within this place. We dedicate ourselves to love's service. We join our hearts in the knowing of this place within us all. And so it is. And so it is. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you. So Marianne, first question out of the box, out of the gate, is why on earth would you be willing to subject yourself to something like the U.S. political <laughs> process and system and, and uh, you know, why are you running? Well, you know, I'm sure that many of your listeners, if not all of your listeners, uh, Waylon, are interested in transforming the world. That's, that's the buzz of this moment. That's the zeitgeist of this moment. And we want to transform it because we know that it, we must, that the situation in too many ways on the planet, not just in this country but globally, are unsustainable. But I believe that when we are coming up with ideas about how to transform the world, we cannot leave electoral politics out of the formulation. We can't afford to do that. You know, many people say that they're conscious today, but you can't be selectively conscious. You can't be conscious about your body, conscious about your food, conscious about your relationships, but not about politics. You can't be selectively conscious. You can't be selectively awake. So I don't believe uh, with my running for office that I've turned a corner into some new activity, I just think the same transformational conversation that we're all having about everything else needs to be applied to the larger collective and to a country and so forth. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing it because I believe there's a limit to what we can do from the sidelines today. There's a limit to what we can do from online petitions. There's a limit to what we can even do from the nonprofit uh, sector, which I've been very involved with, don't get me wrong. But yeah. I just think these are one ramparts. We, we still have to crash the political ramparts uh, for our team, as it were. Yeah, and you actually, I think 17, uh, if I'm doing my math correctly, seven, no, quite a lot longer, something like 20 years ago, you wrote a book about transforming the political process. Yes, 1997. Right. Um, so this is a long time interest of yours. I guess my question, just to refine it a little bit, is because I think everyone agrees with what you said, we need to, uh, you know, take the bull by the horns to, to create a more enlightened society is why, you know, everyone agrees with that, but no one really wants to step forward and be the one to have to deal with the kind of aggression and hate and <clears throat> fundraising and, you know, it's a really difficult path to enter into politics. Why are you willing to do that yourself personally? First of all, it's interesting that you use the term taking the bull by the horns. Um, that's a suicidal thing to do, so I think yeah. it's a very interesting uh, image that we would use for success. Uh, I don't think uh, either in politics or in any other endeavor I've taken on in my life that I think in terms of taking the bull by the horns, but I do think in terms of knowing that there are angels pushing us from behind, 
uh, that is, it says in the Jewish Talmud, over every blade of grass, there is an angel bent over saying, grow, grow, grow. I do believe that there is a, <clears throat> an invisible blueprint, obviously, by which the embryo becomes the baby and the bud becomes the blossom and the acorn becomes the oak tree. So the embryo doesn't take the bull by the horns, nor does the bud, nor does the oak tree. It simply actualizes that which it is. So I don't feel that I'm taking any bull by the horns. I feel that I'm doing what everybody I know is doing, and that is to the best of my ability, answering the call of my own spirit. Because the call of our own spirit, just like every cell in the body is assigned, some are assigned to the blood, some are assigned to the bones, some are assigned to the liver, some are assigned to the lungs. Each and every one of us are assigned. Uh, this show that you're doing is your assignment. When you were talking about Sean, yoga is her assignment. Somebody else's assignment is art. Somebody else's ass assignment is business. Somebody else's assignment is... is uh, uh, education and no, the form of our assignment is not what matters. What matters is the energy of upliftment that all of us are feeling assigned to bring in whatever area we're led to bring it. For whatever reason, uh, this issue was an itch that I couldn't scratch. I spent a year in very serious inquiry uh, within myself, with my closest friends and family, and I, I felt that perhaps, you know, I, perhaps I could be of value, perhaps I could contribute something. Uh, that the conversation that so many of us are involved in, the more conscious conversation is so lacking in our politics today. And this has created, first of all, it's a terrible schism because when you lack consciousness, then you lack, you, you, you lack a propensity towards conscious behavior. But I think a lot of people in the consciousness community particularly have felt very turned off, uh, very disengaged from politics, saying, well, it's so unconscious, I don't want to go there. But if those of us who are having a more conscious conversation don't put the higher conscious dynamic, consciousness dynamic there, how can we complain in a way we have been withholding our contribution? And uh, I like to, uh, uh, you know, I, I like to say what I think. That's kind of well established and that's what I think. But at a certain point, I think we're all feeling this now, talk is not enough. I think the era of data collection is over, and I think it's time for all of us to step it up in whatever field and in whatever way, because uh, the perilous uh, stress points on the planet today uh, mean that we can turn the Titanic around, but we have to do so quickly. So in terms of talk not being enough, and I was smiling <laughs> because you're clearly, your sign is you're an incredibly eloquent leader and speaker. Um, you remind me, we've hosted Deepak Chopra on this show twice, and he is incredibly eloquent. He, like yourself, has been featured all over, best-selling books, been on Oprah. But how can you take that kind of leadership and, and uh, you know, once you're in Congress dealing with all this legislation and this maneuvering and scheming, you know, everyone loves to watch House of Cards, can you bring a higher consciousness into that kind of world? Well, first of all, we're all hoping that the actual reality in Washington is not quite as dark as yes. House, of, House of Cards. Right. Yeah. I, I think that democracy is not just broken in Washington. I think it's broken in our own hearts and minds. I think the very fact that you and I are having this conversation is an example. It, it's not just that the larger political issues have to be uh, brought to a new place in Washington. They have to be brought to a new place in America. The very fact we're having this conversation. So that's where I feel that hopefully I can be of value if I have the honor of winning the seat. Um, a larger platform of, of political purpose and political consideration, not only in Washington but throughout the country. In terms of Washington and dealing with people, you know, I was an AIDS activist, very involved in in the AIDS community when that scourge came upon us. And I didn't say, nor did anyone else, ooh, let's not go there. It's a sickness. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you're a healer, you don't divert your attention away from sickness, do you? Right, well said. And I also think that one of the reasons that Washington is so sick is because we have allowed it to be by our own disengagement and um, um, disconnection from what's been happening. And as a consequence, uh, we have now developed in the United States a legalized system of bribery and corruption. Um, this is the death of our democracy. Moneyed forces influence the functioning of our government now in a way that is so disproportionate to the power and influence wielded by the average citizen that we're dismantling the basics of democracy here. We're, we're making a mockery of the, of the Gettysburg Address. We're, we're, for all intents and purposes, I think describing us as a government of the people, by the people, for the people is, um, I think we really need to think about that. Have we not become a government of a few of the people, by a few of the people, for a few of the people? If we don't get in there, Waylon, if we don't actually run candidates, 
independent minded candidates who are saying that and saying we need a constitutional amendment, we need to outlaw the influence of money on politics and do all the interim measures necessary, then we, we are just bystanders to the dismantling of democracy and reversion to an aristocratic system. And I think that we, we uh, repudiated aristocracy 200 years ago and it's time to repudiate it again. Amen. So the next obvious question is, and it seems like things are unfolding quite naturally in an auspicious way, is, is this just a candidacy out of left field, <clears throat> a hope and a prayer, or is it also something practical? Can you actually win? Well, you know, it's funny when people say, is this a vanity uh, candidacy? That's almost funny. I don't know what's vain about going into a situation where everybody's going to, some people, not everybody's going to say mean things about you, lie about you, smear you, embarrass you, humiliate you, and print bad pictures. So, there's, you know, you want to be vain, and uh, and if you, you know, if, if they say if it's just an ego trip, or, you know, if, an ego trip would be just continuing exactly what I do and, you know, trying to do it in more places. I mean, hello. Um, so, no, I would not be doing this were I not very serious about it. And I could not be acting in integrity with the people um, from whom I'm, I'm asking their support in the form of votes, in the form of financial contribution. This is serious business. And, um, you know, Martin Luther King said, your life begins to end on the day you stop talking about things that really matter. But this, to me, really matters. And I think anybody who either knows me or has seen my work over the last 30 years uh, knows that I, I'm, I hopefully I have a good sense of humor, but I'm a very serious woman and I'm very serious about this. So what's the game plan? How are we going to uh, all support you and help you win? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the game plan is is to receive the beneficence of people like yourself who are helping me get the word out. You know, until the money is out, the money is in, and it's obscenely expensive to run for office. And we have over 400,000 registered voters in this district. And even though the message that we're giving, the idea of the, of the money in politics being the underlying cancer, the underlying issue underlying other issues, the fact that we need a politics of conscience, the fact that we need love as a bottom line and politics as where, where, well as everywhere else, the fact that humanitarian values rather than economic values should order our civilization, that until then, uh, just as they say in AA, that a person is as sick as their secrets, so is a nation. I don't think the average American realizes that among all advanced nations of the world, we have the second highest child poverty rate, second only to Romania. I don't think that the average American even realizes we have the largest mass incarceration rate in the world. So I think getting this message out to, is the issue. So people like yourself giving me the opportunity to talk to more people. And in order to reach enough people, you need paid media. And I'm in Los Angeles, one of the most expensive media markets you could possibly have. So we've raised quite a bit of money, enough money to be a credible candidacy, but not enough money to be a competitive candidacy in these next three months, the, the final trimester of the campaign, because I only have three months now before the June 3rd primary. All of that is to just say, bottom line, I need uh, more financial support. You know, if everybody who is watching your show who feels a yes in their heart sends $5, I do believe that there are enough people in this country that if everybody who felt yes about it just sent in five. That's what a grassroots campaign is. I've announced publicly I'm not taking special interest PAC money, not taking lobbyist money. Our average donation is $61. Wow. So I think that if everybody who does feel yes, you know, it's a combination. People like yourself who give me a greater opportunity to reach people. And secondly, people who do feel resonant with it give whatever is comfortable for them so that I can have the material resources. Like you said, how serious is this? It's very serious. That means we need the material resources for paid advertising, um, you know, paid promotion. And then if, if everybody does that, yeah, absolutely, we have a real shot here. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like if, if we uh, build it, they will vote. You know, um, we hosted Governor Dean on this show before, and he obviously was one of the first to create this grassroots funded campaign where the average yeah. donation was something mm -hmm. like $60 instead of, uh, you know, as you were saying, kind of backroom deals and secrets and, you know, uh, negotiations that have nothing to do with the average citizen. Um, so we have a, um, a lot of audience questions. Uh, may I of, say one thing, yeah, if I may? I think what people need to realize when you just said back deals, secret negotiations, there's nothing secret about it at all. That's what's so horrible today. Our mm. corruption and bribery are right out in the open. It's all legal now, um, particularly because of the Citizens United case. So um, it's actually not secrets at all, and it's not negotiations, it's contributions. It's huge multinational corporations and billionaires who are, who are, who are through independent expenditures, 
pouring money into campaign seasons and most people feel in order to get elected and stay elected they have to vote according to their their desires. That's a wonderful, I mean, a powerful point, if not wonderful, uh, during the entire economic crisis that was caused by a lot of corruption. Mm -hmm. One of the worst things is that almost nothing that some of these people were doing was actually technically illegal. It was morally unethical, but is now somewhat legal to use the system instead of to serve. Absolutely. Everything that Richard Nixon did, that he got, you know, he was, you know, he was going to be impeached had he not resigned. Everything that he did would be considered legal now because wow. the government has just given itself all this legal authority in the name of, you know, of fear of our, of our terrorism. And also, in addition to what you just said, it's not just how much what you and I would consider should be criminal behavior was no longer criminal, but also even that which was the fact that none of the biggies have been prosecuted at all. It's enough to make you sick. Yes. Yeah, enough to make you run well, I'm glad you're doing something. <laughs> I mean, typically we try and uh, you know do a little bit more journalism and ask hard-hitting questions. But frankly, I'm so in love with the notion of, of folks like yourself running and serving. Um, it's hard to ask tough questions here. So here's here's my attempt at a tough question. If you if we all send in our five dollars and we support you actively and get the word out, share on Facebook, do all the right things, and your candidacy. My, one of my favorite movies ever is The Candidate with Robert Redford, your, uh, which is very similar. Your candidacy becomes a real thing and you actually win. The line that ends that movie is Redford says, what now? Because he almost didn't expect to win. Let's say you're in Washington next year. What are going to be your top priorities, like Citizens United or... Well, yes, the effort to, you know, we, we needed a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery. We needed a constitutional amendment to give women the right to vote. And I think we need a constitutional amendment to outlaw the influence of money on our politics and establish that corporations do not have the rights of personhood. It is not easy to amend the U.S. Constitution, nor should it be. But there is a conversation. There's a conversation inside Congress. There's a conversation outside. Robert Reich, there's this film, uh, Inequality for All, Common Cause, Move to Amend.org. And there are senators and Congress people already having that conversation in Congress. So I would see my election as a mandate to do everything I possibly could uh, to increase, uh, to help magnify uh, that conversation. I would also be uh, one of the signers of a of the bill having to do with drones and accountability. I'm I'm very concerned about the drones that are on the way. I also would vote not to reenact the military authorization that we've been giving to the president ever since uh, 9/11. You know, when Roosevelt, when Pearl Harbor happened, Roosevelt had to go uh, to Congress and ask Congress to declare war because even though the founders gave to the president. You know, we would have the president as commander-in-chief, therefore you have a civilian commander-in-chief, which is our protection against a military coup. It's great. But the founders gave it to Congress to declare war. And we just had, you know, Congress has just abdicated their constitutional responsibility and continue to enact every single year this military authorization given to the president. Which, you know, maybe for a year or two after 9-11, you could argue that you can't tie his hand, you've got to let him do whatever. But this is just continuing now. It is a, a, a an historic uh, overreach. Uh, and it's not even an overreach because Congress has given it to the president. And that's why we have a permanent war machine. They just kind of go wherever they want to go. And Congress goes, oh, okay. No. These are the kinds of things I would be very interested to, uh, uh, the conversations around these things, to participate. That that should not be the case. We should not have a permanent war economy. Drones should not be coming with the kind of extraordinary ability, technical ability they have to know, you know who you're sleeping with and what room you just walked into and what you're logging on to on your computer. Um, I also think we need a Department of Peace. I would be glad to sign in on that uh, because right now we have a very allopathic model in politics. You know, when it comes to violence, the only real methodology is the application of brute force. You know, you could liken, uh, you could liken uh, the military to, to your surgeon, and sometimes invasive measures are necessary, but I don't think anybody watching your program would go to the surgeon first if they had a problem. You would do everything else, you know, you'd look for nutrition, a chiropractor, every, every other modality before you just jumped into surgery. So a Department of Peace is important because it would be a cabinet level position articulating, researching, and facilitating non-violent problem-solving options when it comes to both domestic and international violence. It's just a different mindset. It's a different conversation about war and peace and, and violence and, uh, and peace. So, yeah, I'd be happy to be on, You've been working, sorry, on the Department of Peace for many years, right? 
Yes, I, I absolutely. I have been co-founded the Peace Alliance, started the Department of Peace campaign. Dennis Kucinich first introduced a bill for the Department of Peace. He's no longer in Congress, but Representative Barbara Lee from Oakland, California, now has reintroduced the bill. It's called the Department of Peace Building. And he just endorsed your candidacy. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. As did uh, Governor J uh, Jesse Ventura and right. Tom Hartman and uh, former Michigan Governor uh, Jennifer Granholm. Uh, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, well, I'm sure our Senator uh, Mark Udall and uh, Congressman Polis right here at, uh, around Boulder would uh, be happy to endorse as well. They're doing well, some... running as an independent, and so yeah. some Democrats have to, uh, they, you know, there's, there's a process, a journey there that, that people yeah. have to go through. Yeah. Well, they're very independent Democrats. So that's a very interesting question. So why have you chosen, because I'm sure it's quite intentional, uh, and I've actually watched videos where you describe why you have, but for those who are watching, why are you running as an independent? Well, first of all, I'm a lifelong Democrat, and if I were to win, I would caucus with Democrats. But I think of myself as a Bobby Kennedy Democrat, a Paul Wellstone Democrat, and the Democratic Party has been taking such a corporatist direction in the last few years, such a militarist direction. I'm not saying they're no different than the Republicans, but for me, they're not different enough. I feel that the, the real point that we all need to be looking at is not where they're so different, but the ways in which they're so similar. And that has to do with how beholden they are to the same corporate money uh, that funds one, funds the others. And so I think that right now the two parties have a duopoly, a chokehold on our system, and it's sucking the oxygen out of our public discourse. Abolition did not come from a major party. Women's suffrage didn't come from a major party. Civil rights movement didn't come from a major party. We need to be having an American conversation that is unfiltered by, are you a Democrat, or are you a Republican, are you a Green, are you a Libertarian? We need to have a more sober, conscious conversation than can, that, that can emerge from that kind of separation and adversarial and oppositional perspective out of right outside the gate. So one of my goals, since I've been a little kid reading about Abraham Lincoln and our, our various leaders um, throughout history, has been to get filthy rich, doing good work, and then run for office myself. And one of my personal questions for you, if I may, is, and I guess I've sort of already asked this, but is, let's say you went and you're there, do you really feel like it's a, you would have enough power in this huge Congress that can be very divided and very stuck, and it's on some level meant to be uh, a slow-moving body? Why is this the best use of your time and energy when you can reach millions of people speaking or writing? Well. The ultimate answer is what I said before, that there's a limit to what you can do from the sidelines. If I were to be elected, if I am elected, I will only be one of 435 people in Congress. I'm not naive about the externalized power that that gives me, and I don't think any one of my district is either. But this is an open seat for the first time in 38 years, so whoever gets in there will be a first-time congresswoman. But we, the part of the conscious conversation is that it's not just what you can do on the outside. It's how a more conscious conversation itself can, can begin to influence what happens. Just like what we think influences our behavior, what's a, what a collective begins to think influences its behavior. And I would hope that if elected, I could bring something to the table in terms of a larger context around issues that would have some beneficent influence on the thinking and even behavior of my colleagues. So we have uh, hundreds of... Uh, reader questions coming in. Um, I'd love to ask a few. One of the first here is saying, you know, how can you change the conversation, which is quite polarized, about climate change? About climate change. Well, you know, climate change is just one more area where if you don't deal with the underlying issue of money and politics, then then forget it. We cannot adequately address climate change and the urgency of the situation at this moment as long as fossil fuel companies continue to have the undue influence on our policy making decisions that they do. I mean, just like we can't have universal health care as long as health insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies dominate the conversation. We will not be able to deal with GMOs and herbicides and pesticides and so forth in our food as long as chemical companies and um, uh, big agricultural companies dominate. That's why, until we deal with a fundamental bleak, this is the broken aorta. And that's why I feel that the conversation, you can't just say, we're going to fight them. You know, most politicians, I'm going to go to Washington, I'm going to fight. Wayland, my, my conversation is, why is it that at this point in our history, 
for the average American to believe that we can be reasonably sure that we're not like actively destroying the planet. We can be reasonably assured that our food is not poisonous. We can be reasonably assured that our children can get a decent education. Why is that such a fight today? And the reason it's such a fight is because forces, which would prefer the major resources of our country be kept in the hands of a very few people, have more say because of the corrupt influence of money. So I would seek in all ways to, to be one of the passionate advocates, which to me any sane person would be, uh, for the development of green energy technology um, and, and renewables and so forth. I would be deeply critical of the fact that we're giving billions of dollars in subsidies to the oil companies while they're making trillions. I mean, the whole thing is truly, truly sick, actually. Yeah. Um, and and all, all I could do is use my voice and use the appropriate... Um, uh, the appropriate power that is vested in any one congressperson. I also believe, because I do have a national readership, that I could contribute in some way to more people around the country understanding the issues in a way that might lead to more progressive, more enlightened candidates um, in their districts. So one phenomenon we see again and again, particularly with inspiring leaders like yourself, is once in office, like say President Obama, while I personally have voted for Obama and uh, am still quite a fan of him as a human being and I think he's trying to do the right thing. There's such an unending uh, list of compromises and caving and some success obviously, a uh, great deal of success in some areas. Um, but there's so much, much disenchantment by those who are originally supporters. How would you go into this? you know, Congress where by nature you have to compromise and negotiate uh, and still maintain the support <laughs> of your, you know, most fervent fans. There's a difference between political compromise, which is part of what the process is and should be, and caving on your principles. They're two very different things. A certain level of political compromise is the art of legislation. But right. caving on your principles, all I can say is, why would I need to? I'm running a grassroots campaign. I'm not getting multinational corporate donate pack money so it's like well, why would I need to in my career my bigger risk is people such as your own audience saying too bad what happened to Mary Ann wow it's really right. that would be a bigger risk for me because I because I have to have a career on the other side of this you know what I mean so, right. so for me there's, there's no point I, I don't need to do this I'm not looking for a job as a career politician I'm, I'm looking for the high that is the high of my career for the last 30 years and that's saying it the way I see it <laughs> like that's it. what I'm looking for. That's what that's the fun part to me. Right. I don't know where you're from, but it sounded like a little accent was coming out there. Well, I come from Texas, and every once in a while, I like it. Um, <clears throat> so there's so many good questions here. It's it's uh, hard to uh, do two things at once, mm -hmm. and we put us. I hope that your audience yeah. knows that the website, should they be interested, is MarianneForCongress.com. Yeah, and then you were mentioning also a book. Uh, people can go to your personal website as well, right? Yes, my, my book that came out this year is called A Year of Miracles, and people can go to Marianne.com and find out about that. Right. Well, thank you for that. So uh, maybe one final question from the <coughs> audience. They all seem to be huge fans. There's a lot of questions here about health. Um, do you think the health of the people in the, our country today has gotten better or worse in the last few years? Um, why do you think that, and how uh, can politics or government help rectify that situation? Well, I think that it's very clear that something's not right, mm -hmm. and, and there are many ways uh, that we can uh, see uh, elements in our food, elements in our land, elements in our water, elements in our air. You know, the World Health Organization now has put on its list of carcinogens the air we breathe. And once again, you go back to the corrupt influence of money on politics. How many times where the government, which should be a balancing agent between individual, including economic freedom, and concern for the common good, caves to huge multinational corporate interests particularly, and individual <coughs> moneyed interests, and, and do things that are in fact not in the best interests of the people of the United States. Really taking the juice, taking the claws, taking the power out of things like the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, and so forth. Look, the President Obama, and you know, it's a mystery there on, on the President Obama. It's simply a mystery. I don't know if we'll ever know in our lifetimes how his presidency, and in some ways, has been so different than what we all thought in 2008. But I'll tell you something. President Obama has taken the vice president of policy at Monsanto, a man named Michael Taylor, and made him uh, a deputy food czar. What do you even say to this? 
So yeah. um, we, we have a we have a problem on our hands. And once again, until we get the money out of politics, no, I, you know, it, it's like politicians. If a doctor, a medical doctor, has both a legal and an ethical responsibility to tell you the bad news, and sometimes politicians gloss over the bad news because they want you to elect them and think they're some kind of savior. And let me tell you something: we're not going to be able to get to the solution until we name the problem. So when somebody says, what about our health? Our health is in trouble as long as, just like everything else, it's an effect of a deeper cause. It's a symptom of a deeper disease. And that is the fact that we live in a society today in which a kind of sociopathic element, you know, where there's no conscience, there's, it's, it's sociopathic. And, and that's why you don't want corporations running your world, because a corporation is, does not have a soul. So, no, there's an assault on the health of Americans. And then, of course, the answer that the system gives you is pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical. Because not only is there so much about, about uh, um, policy, our policy, that actually leads at least indirectly to our being sick, but then we also have a policy trend that leads indirectly to the pharmaceuticals being able to, not that they don't do great things, too, but in too many cases, we are just loaded with pharmaceuticals rather than really aided in doing that which it would take to cultivate health to begin with. One area that Elephant Journal uh, focuses on a lot is right livelihood or mindful business. And it's interesting to me, I was just meeting with a board member of Chipotle um, yesterday. They're uh, aiming to be one of the first large chains to go completely GMO free, and they're already GMO transparent. Um, that, you know, some of these businesses like Chipotle or Whole Foods, while imperfect, I'm sure, in many ways, are, by doing the right thing, are actually making money hand over fist. Absolutely. And, and making health accessible. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's arguable in some ways, but Chipotle is certainly quite affordable and healthy. And I think you're right. There is a trend in everything. How to be more conscious. Conscious capitalism. You yeah. know, I think that it, 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 the, the nuanced and very significant critical conversation here is between high-minded capitalism, where there is fair exchange. Uh, you create something of value. Somebody takes it, gives you a dollar for it. They walk away with more, and you walk away with more. That's a good thing. We celebrate that in America. Right. The problem we have on our hands is that over the last few decades, we have allowed the emergence of a predatory strain of capitalism, which has to do with my doing whatever it takes to get the most from you while giving the least to you, which is such an ethical breakdown. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. There's now more of a conversation among uh, people in business in the United States passionate capitalists talking about how we can be more conscious. You know, Waylon, in every area of our society, there's a conversation about how to be more conscious everywhere except politics. That's why I hope that I win this race. That's why I believe in the campaign, because I think we can create a space. This isn't just about one woman running for Congress. You know, one woman winning a, winning a congressional seat is not going to change everything. But what it can do is help create a space where there's more possibility, more opportunity for more candidacies, uh, more candidates, and more possibilities of, of winning in places where people are stepping forward to having the conversation that is is not only a little bit more high-minded, but a little more brutally honest. One more uh, audience question. This is, comes from Dan Landrum. It's the top <laughs> of the question. Uh, what, and we've covered some of this, but... I love how he says it. What are the specifics of what you will do as a U.S. representative? Do you have the skills and experience to be effective? Well, there are two issues in this in this conversation. Um, and I want to go to the second one first because I think the first one I've covered. I've talked about the issue of money and politics, drone accountability, uh, military authorization, not giving it. I don't think we should enact the National Defense Authorization Act every year that gives the the government, the legal authority to detain indefinitely American citizens, the Department of Peace, etc. So what would I do? I've already gone over the kinds of how I would feel about issues. But the second thing that the gentleman asked is actually mo most important, Waylon. Who am I to be qualified? This is what's so sick in America today. Any of us, if you're an American citizen, you're qualified. This issue of we need somebody who already knows how to work that system. If you're going to elect people who have an experience of the system as it is, all you're going to do is perpetuate the system as it is. The system is the problem. Looking to the political status quo to deliver us from these extraordinary challenges is getting increasingly naive and unreasonable because the political status quo, quo created these problems. Through the banking. Marianne, of that Einstein quote, I think you've quoted it. Yes, that you can't solve the problems from the level of thinking. So in America, you know, the founders intended the House of Representatives to be the people's house, they called it. They thought the farmer would come in for a while, the, the 
shopkeeper would come in for a while, the candle maker would come in for a while. Well, and that's what it's supposed to be. The teacher should be there for a while, the activist should be there for a while, the stay-at-home parent should be there for a while, the scientist should be there for a while. That's, that's what's wrong, that it's just people who are not traditional politicians and political hacks running for office. So you could say that in a way, the fact that I haven't been part of the system is what makes me more qualified to engage the conversation that I believe we need to have today. The Constitution is so interesting, not only what the founders said, but what they didn't say. They didn't say you have to be a lawyer, you have to be uh, something like that. They didn't for that reason. They left it to every generation to determine for itself what skill sets we feel are most adequate, are need, most needed to address the challenges of our time. So I think the fact that I, I'm not of the old conversation actually makes me more qualified, not less. Yeah, well, you're, you've converted me. Um, I mean, I came into this being super inspired, but uh, maybe this next question could be our last. Uh, it's, again, top voted from Roxana Villa, and I feel like it uh, speaks to this fundamental question. At this point, I think probably... Um, just about everybody loves you and supports your candidacy, um, but as Roxana says, when I speak to my friends about Marianne with excitement and hope, they say things like, it won't happen. How do, I, how do we address this kind of attitude? Well, you know, President uh, Obama in 08 was all the yes we can, yes we can. I would say this, when the abolitionists said we must abolish slavery, they were told it will never happen. When the women suffragettes said we must give women the right to vote, they were told it will never happen. When the civil rights marchers said we need to end uh, legalized segregation in the American South and the Jim Crow laws, they were told it will never happen. Anybody who has ever stood up for social justice in the United States or probably anywhere else has been told by the status quo it will never happen. That, that's, that's the way that goes, but let me tell you something else. The majority doesn't really have the say. You know, the, the majority didn't wake up one day and say, let's free the slaves. The majority didn't wake up one day and say, let's give women the right to vote. The majority didn't wake up one day and say, let's end segregation. Social justice always moves forward because of a small group of people considered outrageous radicals by the status quo of their time who have a better idea. So I'll tell you something. I might not win this race, although I think I will, but what we're talking about here, oh, it will happen. That is the narrative. That is the journey. American democracy, we've gotten it wrong before, Wayland. We've gotten it wrong a lot. We had slavery, for God's sakes. But we have tended throughout our history to self-correct. Generations have arisen so that a generation arose, abolished slavery. A generation arose, gave women the right to vote. A generation arose, ended segregation in the South. Let's not be the first generation to wimp out on, on doing what it what needs to be done to course correct our country and put democracy back on track. And if we're going to like say, oh, okay, just because the status quo says it'll never happen, I mean, hello, what have you ever wanted to do that was meaningful and purposeful in your life that people who couldn't see the vision said it'll never happen? You know, that's, uh, that should be the least of the energetic walls uh, that, uh, that keep us from just keeping, uh, keeping on. And, um, you know, I love I love it when you get going. You start pointing and like <laughs> starts rocking back and forth, and your head comes out. I want to ask you more tough questions. Um, yeah, so super inspiring. Uh, obviously, I can see why you're a successful public speaker, which is a very important skill to be able to move people. Um, so thank you so much, Marianne, for joining thank us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I've wanted to meet you. I'm glad that we had this opportunity. Yeah. And I how long you for the great work. How long do you have before uh, the vote? That's the point. Only three months, less than three months before primary day. So I hope people who do feel in their hearts a resonance with this uh, will go to the website, MarianneForCongress.com, and, 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 and hopefully, if they feel moved to, donate whatever they can to help us make this happen. One final personal question coming from a kind of elephant journal kind of world is, how do you maintain your own health and happiness and balance while you're so busy in these next three months? It's challenging, and I think uh, the assaults on my nervous system, there were times uh, two or three months ago when I would say I, I, uh, it, it took me a while. I, I had some, uh, some hard times, but uh, it's like anything else in life. And also with a political campaign, you know that you're not gonna, it's not going to be like this forever. It's a limited period of time. It's a finite period of time, and you simply decide to slam it because you don't want to 
you know, if, if I win or if I lose, I want to feel on that day I gave it my best. And that just keeps you going. And you also realize the, the consequences of your getting off your center. And so I'm, I'm doing my best to stay on. Well, thank you. Thank you for your service. And uh, we'll be um, featuring this on the front page of ElephantJournal.com and doing anything we can to support. And while we're not, we are in California. It's actually our most red state. Um, you know, uh, I think it's safe to say we endorse your candidacy. And thank you so much, Marianne. So we could end thank with you. a... Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, we could end with a bow of mutual respect as it's our tradition on the show. So thank you, Marianne. Thank you.